to another episode of Plant-Based Mafia, where everything is plant-based. Last episode, we went over Chapter 6 of Dr. Esselstyn's famous book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And we are going to be jumping right into Chapter 7. We're going to be reading the entire book, uh, which will take uh, several episodes. And then after... We are done with this book. We're going to get into a whole bunch of other different content, um, all the way from you know nutritional stuff to uh, working out, weight loss, um, startup. So a big part of why I transitioned into a plant-based lifestyle is not just only to save my life because I had cardiovascular disease, but I, what I noticed was that I did not have the energy to be productive. And as a filmmaker, it is incredibly important that you have youth-like energy that is going to take you through a 20-hour day. And as an entrepreneur, I don't have a paycheck that comes and I have to go out and earn my own paycheck. I have a media company, um, some exciting stuff that we're doing. Uh, I have a film festival that we're building, an intellectual properties company. We're building this fantastic new app that's going to revolutionize the relationship between consumers and companies and advertisers. So, I mean, I'm working 20-hour days and just don't have the energy to do that if you're pounding cheese steaks and milkshakes and burgers and pizza. It's just impossible. So there's no way that I'd be able to be productive living on a typical unhealthy, toxic American diet. It is just impossible. And honestly, at 43 years old, I've got a lot of years of productivity left in me, and I really want to, you know, I want to be able to maximize those years, and there's no way that I can do that eating a typical toxic American diet. That's why we started Plant-Based Mafia. It's not just about nutrition. It's not just about heart disease and weight loss. It's about living the best possible you that you could live, whatever that might be for me. It's being a successful entrepreneur, a filmmaker, and doing all these wonderful things. And the foundation of that starts with my nutrition. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. So it's going to be really cool through the journey that I'm taking is I'm going to be showing everyone who's watching, subscribers, Instagram, anyone, I'm going to show you how a startup works and how the failures are going to come in and how we're going to overcome those failures. That's going to be super cool. And I'm going to show you from soup to nuts how you take something that's just an idea, you execute it, and you make it super successful. It's a very exciting time, too. I just sold my first film that I produced called Austin Found. Great director. Other really fantastic producers were on board. And that film was picked up. It's going to be um, going to be doing an awesome red carpet premiere in L.A. It's going to be played at the famous Chinese theater on Hollywood Boulevard. So I only went out to Hollywood a few years ago, and I said I'm going to become a filmmaker with no background and no experience. And I did it, and I was able to execute that the, for several reasons. But you know, one of them is just getting up and doing, learning, meeting the right people introducing yourself and just never taking no for an answer. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, a plant-based diet was one of the things that helped me succeed at doing that because it not only did it gave me give me energy, but it gave me this extra confidence, just being able to eat these foods, just it had a very, very positive effect on my body from a scientific perspective. Um, so it's, that's, those are a lot of the things that we're going to be covering, and I hope anyone who's feeling, you know, kind of down and depressed and sluggish and they need a transition in their life really will consider a plant-based nutritional life switch and really consider taking on that those types of foods. So here we are. We're going to start. We're going to jump into Chapter 7. Uh, why didn't anyone tell me? And here we go. One of the longtime followers of my nutrition plan is a man named Abraham Brickner, now retired, who was the Cleveland Clinic's Director of Health Services, Research, and Program Development. Abe's mother died of heart disease when she was 62. 
His brother had bypass surgery at the age of 55 and died from his heart disease a decade later. One of Abe's nephews had a heart attack at 45. A second nephew died from a heart attack at 42. Abe had his first bypass at 55 and his second at 65. Although he began to modify his eating habits somewhat after the first surgery, for most of his life, Abe had eaten a high-fat diet with steaks from his father's grocery, fried in butter, uh, half a pound of corned beef on a heel of bread, chopped liver with schmaltz, which is pure chicken fat, once a week, and a big plate of waffles after the movies on, on Sunday nights. Abe, a career healthcare planner, and a consumer advocate had paid considerable attention to health matters over the years. And as he says, when a cholesterol of 250 was normal, I met the standard. When a cholesterol of 250 was normal, it is hard to believe, but for decades, it was the conventional wisdom that blood levels of cholesterol up to 300 milligrams were perfectly normal. Over the years, the advice from the experts had varied and consumers of healthcare had been understandably confused about what cholesterol level should be their goal. It had been a constantly moving target. Most recently, national health organizations, the American Heart Association, the National Cholesterol Education Program, and the National Research Council had decreed that serum cholesterol should be below 200 milligrams. These same organizations suggested limiting fat consumption to no more than 30% of the calories consumed each day. But that level of fat consumption has never been shown to arrest or reverse coronary artery disease. Quite contrary, research has shown that while cutting fat consumption to the level from even higher levels may help slow the disease's progress, the disease nonetheless will progress. The truth is that the medical profession knows better. We have known for a long time that one out of every four pers persons who have, who have heart attacks had a blood cholesterol level between 180 and 210. And we know that more than a third of those in the Framingham Heart Study who had heart disease showed cholesterol levels between 150 and 200 milligrams. That means that millions of Americans who are doing the best they can to meet the standards set by national health officials are, in spite of their efforts, getting sick. Here's a clear, plain English translation of what our government and the national health agencies have done. They have chosen a safe cholesterol level for the public that virtually guarantees if everyone actually met their stated goal, that every year more than 1.2 million Americans will suffer heart attacks and that's millions more will watch the inevitable progression of their coronary artery disease. What is going on here? If the evidence is so clear that the goal set for cholesterol levels should be set below 150, why don't the national experts and policymakers tell us that? When we ask representatives of our government to establish safe levels of bacteria in our drinking water, they do not select a level at which a substantial proportion of the population will contract cholera and dysentery. Instead, they set a level that guarantees none of us will be infected. The case is similar with official standards for our contaminants. We do not choose a level of which 20% of our children would develop lead-induced brain disease from lead in the water. We choose a level that ensures the safety of everyone. So why is the policy so different when it comes to levels of cholesterol in the blood? The answer lies in a complex blend of culture, habit, taste, and other factors, including, frankly, a somewhat condescending attitude among medical experts towards the lay public. Let's look at the facts. To begin with, it is true that people have a craving for oil, dairy, and animal fat, and that includes the medical students who study the problem. We are immersed in an environment of toxic food and is attractive to tasteful, reasonable priced, and heavily advertised. And there are powerful commercial interests that want no change in the American diet. Over the years, there have been a number of attempts to bring nutritional recommendations more into line 
with what the science actually shows. In every case, intensive lobbying by industry, the producers, purveyors of dairy products, meat and poultry, has caused those who set the standards to pull their punches. To put it quite simply, the fox is in the hen house. Nowhere is this more apparent than at the United States Department of Agriculture, which since the late 70s has been issuing the government's official guideline on what American citizens should be eating. In a recent editorial for Nutrition Action Health Letter, a publication of the Center for Science in the Public Interest, Michael Jacobson named the, the major official office holders in the USDA and described what each had done for a living before going to work for the Department of Agriculture. Every single one had previously been employed by the dairy, meat, or poultry industry. And as recently as October of 2000, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine successfully litigated to find out exactly who was compensating the members of the USDA's U.S. Dietary Guidelines Committee. It turned out that six of the 11 committee members, including the chairman, had financial ties to the food industry. In my opinion, the Department of Agriculture, which by def definition is supposed to protect and promote the nation's agriculture interests should disqualify, it, disqualify itself from responsibility for setting nutritional standards. The duty belongs more properly to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But so far, the USDA still holds the power to advise Americans on what they should be eating. And every five years when it updates its advice, its guidelines end up, end up misleading the public and betraying the science. As long ago as 1991, for example, proposed changes in the food pyramid would have relegated meat and dairy foods to lesser importance. But by the time the lobbying was finished, the USDA agreed on a misleading compromise for the new proposals that still emphasize consumption of animal protein. Not much has changed since then. Here are some examples drawn from a written critique I delivered in 2005 Food Guidelines Committee. One, USDA recommend, recommendation. Consume three or more ounces equivalent of whole grain products per day, with the rest of the recommended grains coming from whole grain products. In general, at least half of the grains should come from whole grains. In other words, the other half of the grains consumed may come from refined grains, which have lost many of their natural nutrients and fiber content, and which cause elevated levels of triglycerides in the bloodstream, a recognized risk factor in coronary artery disease. USA recommendation two, consume three cups per day of fat-free or low-fat milk or equivalent milk products. Each low-fat milk contains significant amounts of saturated fat, which will clog arteries. In addition, fully 50 million Americans are lactose intolerant. For them, ingesting milk causes gastrointestinal upsets. Milk cons consumption has also been linked to the development of prostate cancer. Casein, the major protein in milk, has been shown in animal studies to powerfully promote cancer growth. USADA recommendation number three, consume less than 10% of calories from saturated fat and less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol per day and keep trans fat addy consumption as low as possible. This is strange and practical advice. I don't know of any food scientist, nutritionist, physician, or other expert who on a daily basis would go to the enormous trouble of calculating how many calories worth of saturated fat, fat they are ingesting, or who have more than a general notion of how many milligrams of cholesterol and trans fat they consume. It is absurd to ask the public to follow rules, rules that even the scientists who invent them do not. I would, it would be far simpler and clearer to advise people to avoid animal-based products the source of all cholesterol and most saturated fat, and also to avoid products labeled hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated since these contain the most harmful trans fats. 
USDA recommendation number four, keep total fat intake between 20 to 35% of calories and most fats coming from sources of polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats such as fish, nuts, and vegetable oils. This recommendation is of a major concern. In effect, your government is suggesting a level of fat consumption that cannot arrest vascular disease and quite the contrary has actually been shown to promote it. In chapter 10, I will discuss the documented harmful effects of monounsaturated oils, but this consumption poses a set of dangers all on its own. Filled with toxins such as PCBs and mercury, fish are a known hazard. So much so that pregnant women are advised to eat them sparingly and the development of fish farming made necessary by the steady depletion of the Earth's ocean poses some new dangers. Fish farming is so unhealthy that its products must be treated with antibiotics and many health authorities advise against eating farm grown fish. There is no doubt that omega-3 fatty acids found in fish are valuable. But there are other safer sources of these acids, which I will discuss in chapter eight. USDA recommendation number five, when selecting and preparing meat, poultry, dry beans, and milk or milk products, make choices that are lean, low fat, or fat free. This is largely obfuscation, confusing and misleading for the majority of people who are unfamiliar with the science. There are no fat-free meats. Some meat is merely less fat than other meat and thus slightly less toxic. The same is true of poultry, and that's just the start of the problem. Mass-produced poultry is so contaminated with bacteria that poultry inspectors, intimately acquainted with this condition, rarely consume it. In fact, you are regularly advised by our health experts not to allow it to infect foods in your refrigerator or your counterpart countertop. As for milk and milk products, they have been clearly implicated in the development of heart disease, strokes, hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, and prostate cancer. And under the impression that milk labeled 2% delivers only 2% of its calories from fat as compared with whole milk, which delivers 55% of its calories from fat, wrong. In fact, 35% of calories from 2% milk are from fat. Similarly, 21% of the calories in 1% milk are from fat. How can it be that an arm of the United States government would design and promote dietary guidelines that if followed guarantee millions of Americans will perish prematurely? This is an international embarrassment and a public health disaster. The truth is that giving the U.S. Department of Agriculture, as presently co configured, the responsibility for issuing such guidelines is much like inviting Al Capone to prepare your income taxes. But our medical organizations have also waffled when it comes to the subject. Although they have been advising us for well over a decade that dairy products, oil, and animal fat are bad for us, and although it becomes clearer with every passing year that vascular disease, cancer, and other illnesses are the direct result of toxic Western diet, these organizations just cannot bring themselves to radically change nutritional recommendations. Instead, the experts keep suggesting that we reduce consumption of animal and dairy fat, that we eat red meat only once or twice a week, for example, and we remove the skin from chicken, advice that is imprecise and vague and does not significantly reduce fat intake. Almost all experts will agree that coronary artery disease is rarely seen in individuals with cholesterol levels consistently below 150 milligrams. Almost all would also agree that reducing fat intake to less than 10% of calories consumed will help mightily in achieving low cholesterol levels. And they would concede that it is impossible to eat a diet 
built around meat, poultry, dairy products, and oil, and still derive less than 10% of the calories from fat. But rather than state these facts clearly to the public, rather than set a truly safe level of blood cholesterol and advise Americans how they can achieve it, the experts balk, often explaining that the public might have an overwhelming sense of frustration and not be able to comply with the nutrition changes necessary. I think this is wrong. We should tell the public what is healthiest for them. People would decide for themselves whether they wish to comply. We as scientists must at least tell them what is optimal. In 1991, I assembled a blue ribbon faculty, nationally known and respected for their expertise in cardiology, nutrition, pathology, pediatrics, epidemiology, and public health for the first national conference on lipids in the elimination and prevention of coronary artery disease. During these two days of presentations in Tucson, Arizona, these scientists were challenged to develop what they felt constituted the optimal diet for health, one least likely to develop coronary artery disease. I asked them to answer the question, what do you tell patients who say, I'll do anything, but I never want to have heart disease, or I have had a heart attack and I never want another one? One panelist replied, have them eat beans, beans, and more beans. Another professor, T. Colin Campbell of Cornell, one of the world's most respected nutritionists and co-author of the China study, said most clearly and forcibly what other faculty members were feeling. If we are reasonably sure of what our data from these studies are telling us, then we must be reticent about recommending a diet which we know is safe and healthy. Scientists can no longer take the attitude that the public cannot benefit from the information they are not ready for. We must have the integrity to tell them the truth and let them decide what to do with it. We cannot force them to follow the guidelines we recommend, but we can give them these guidelines and then let them decide, which is precisely what they don't do. And ironically, I've heard that from cardiologists I've met before that people most likely won't stick to these diets, so they have to just stuff them with medication. And that's unfortunate. And I think if the trend was strong enough, and if the movement was strong enough, and everyone was doing it, people tend to follow. And I don't think the trend is strong enough. I don't think it's in the public spotlight the way that it should be. And I think if it was, you'd see far more people starting to follow. Now, I personally, back to the book, I personally have great faith in the public. We must tell them a diet of roots, stems, seeds, flowers, fruits, and leaves is the healthiest diet and the only diet we can promote, endorse, and recommend. Following the conference, I prepared a summary that was ultimately approved by 10 of the 13 faculty participants. The following four paragraphs reveal the strong stand of the acknowledged experts and might serve as a model for more useful nutritional advice for Americans than what the U.S. government and national health organizations currently provide. Present governmental and national health organizations guidelines do not provide a maximal opportunity to either arrest or prevent coronary artery disease. Studies demonstrate persons following present guidelines will have increased rates of disease progression when compared to persons achieving lower serum lipid levels through diet and or lipid lowering drugs. A diet which would achieve superior results in reducing atherosclerosis would be a 10 to 15% fat provided largely by grains, legumes, vegetables, and fruits. This diet offers protection against the common neoplasms of breast, prostate, colon, and ovary cancer. It also lessens the likelihood of developing obesity, hypertension, strokes, and adult onset diabetes. There are no known adverse effects of such a diet when mineral and vitamin contents are adequate. Children and adolescents require major attention to develop early habits of optimal nutrition. Schools should assume a significant leadership role in achieving this goal. 
Speculation about the degree of public compliance must not influence the accuracy of recommendations. Indisputably, in recommending that Americans convert to plant-based nutrition, we would be asking Americans to undertake profound taste transitions. But there are some potential allies in the cause. Professional chefs of the world, those employed by upscale hotels, restaurants, businesses, clubs, and other venues that require food of exquisite taste, texture, variety, and presentation. These chefs are masters of achieving delightful meals no matter what the basic foods. Several years ago, I was invited to speaking about arresting and reversing heart disease at a luncheon meeting of health maintenance organizations directors at the Broadmoor Hotel in Colorado Springs. I agreed to speak on one condition, if I could be responsible for the lunch menu. The planners of the HMO convention agreed. After my presentation, one doubting audience member declared that nobody would eat a diet consisting of 10% fat or less. Did you enjoy your lunch, I asked. Yes, it was delicious, he replied. Fine, I answered. You should know that it was 10% fat, which was my requirement of the chef if I were to speak here today. Point made, with the help of a master chef, unfortunately, he may have been an exception. A decade ago, I was asked to make a presentation for a highly respected culinary institute. By the time I arrived, the director had decided that he did not want his chefs in training to hear what I had to say, since it clearly conflicted with what they were being taught. Instead, I gave a thumbnail sketch of my data to a much smaller audience, the director and his assistant. A few years later, I was asked to speak at another meeting, the annual National Chefs Convention in Nashville, Tennessee. I proceeded at a special breakout session with approximately 20 chefs, all of whom had coronary artery disease. They'd been done in by their own cooking. The good news is that the word is spreading. Americans are steadily growing more health conscious, which is true. Since I started my research 20 years ago, there have been a marked increase in the number of experts who believe that nutrition plays a critical role in helping you maintain self safe cholesterol levels and in protecting you from the common killer diseases, especially coronary artery disease. And many laymen come to that understanding on their own. A few years after his bypass surgery, Abe Brickner joined a study of people who had undergone the operation. I began to sense from my reading that something was going on. He says, if 50% of the people go back for a second bypass, I wanted to know what was in store for me. Through the study, Abe had another angiogram, which led to his second bypass surgery when he was 65. But as he says today, if I had the knowledge base I have now, I would not even have had the first bypass. The second surgery provided the, f the final flash of insight and self-awareness and sent me into the preventive mode. I was ready when Dr. Esselstyn came along. It took hand-holding to get Abe past his crazy cravings for the fat-filled diet he enjoyed for so many years, but he committed himself to my nutrition plan and he stuck with it ever since. His cholesterol dropped from 235 to 123, which remains to this day. Now in his 80s, Abe Brickner is convinced that he will live to be 100. Best of all, he says, the locus of control is me. The doctor isn't responsible for my health. I am. So that was a wonderful chapter. Really important to understand, too, that the information that is provided to us there's typically an agenda behind it, so question it at all. Question all the information and start to follow people like Dr. Esselstein that have no skin in the game. Dr. Esselstein is doing this because he truly believes and he's not getting paid by you know the cauliflower industry or the raisin industry. It's just he's doing this out of love. So follow what he has to say. It's really, really important. And if you guys are listening on SoundCloud, you could find me on YouTube if you want to watch my videos at 
Plant Based Mafia, and same on, you know, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram as well. Would love your feedback. We're going to be launching our website soon, which is going to be plantbasedmafia.com. And we would just love people to come to the site and uh, post videos and pictures of their journey and videos of their journey and talk to us and tell us what they're doing and anything that we could do to help them would be fantastic. So uh, thank you for tuning in again. And peace. Peace.